Well, here we have a bit of a challenging reading called Understanding Fixed Income Risk and Return. So let's go through this. We've got some new concepts. We've got some new measures. We've got some new formulas. We've got all sorts of exciting stuff for you. So let's dive right in. Let's look at the sources of bond return, and this will help us analyze the risk factors. Uh, first off, you get your coupon and principal payments. That's one source of return. The other important source of return is reinvestment income. Since the coupons are paid periodically over the life of the bond, that's cash flow that needs to be reinvested. And what we're going to assume is that the reinvestment rate at any point in time is the same as the market yield to maturity on the bond. And then we could have a capital gain or loss relative to the constant yield price trajectory. Remember that, that's how the price moves over time if the yield to maturity stays constant. So when we're measuring capital gains or losses, we're not measuring relative to the purchase price, unless that price was par, but if it's anything other than par, it moves as time passes, so we need to calculate the value with that same yield to maturity, but less time to maturity to figure out the price we're going to use to decide whether we've had a capital gain or loss. Now, if we hold the bond to maturity, there's never any capital gain or loss, because remember, that constant yield price trajectory, it all came to the maturity value at maturity. So, at that point, there's no capital gain or loss, because why? Because you're on the constant yield price trajectory. Calculating bond returns. Three years, 6% annual coupon bond. Yield to maturity, 7%. What do we know? It's gotta be at a discount. Yield to maturity is higher than the coupon rate. Our price here is 97.376% of face value and we're gonna hold it to maturity. There's no capital gain or loss. So what did we earn? Well, the principal and interest, we've got three $6 coupon payments here, or 6% of face value coupon payments, and 100% of the face value paid, paid at maturity. So that sums up to 118% of face value. Reinvestment income. Well, our assumption is, is that our reinvested coupons earn the yield to maturity, which here is 7%. And so we take and we grow those at 7%. Well, that first six, we earn interest on it for two periods. The second coupon payment, we earn interest on it for one period. Then we get the last coupon payment. We subtract off the 18, the sum of the coupon payments from the total, and we get 1.29, that's our reinvestment income. 1.29% of face here. So our realized return is the principal and interest of 118 and the reinvestment income of 129, that's our ending value. Here's our beginning value, the price we paid for the bond, its value at the beginning of the three year period. And we've had three years, we take it to the one-third power minus one and find out that we earned overall a realized return of 7%. It's just equal to our yield to maturity. So we held it to maturity, no capital gain or loss. And remember we said, what are the assumptions that you earn your yield to maturity? Well, earlier on we said those three assumptions are, it doesn't default, you hold it to maturity, and your reinvestment rate is equal to the yield to maturity at purchase. When all three of those are met, your realized return will equal the yield to maturity at purchase. And that's what we've demonstrated here with our simple example. How do we calculate a capital gain? Well, sale, so sale price minus the carrying value. But the carrying value is this constant yield price. So our example here, we've got a 20-year bond, 5% semi-annual coupon purchased at yield to maturity of 6%. So the price of that is 88.4426% of face. It's sold after five years for 9140. Do we have a capital gain or not? Well, we have to calculate that carrying value. Remember, 
if you've already been through the financial statement analysis, you know our carrying value, we're amortizing a discount or amortizing a premium over time. So that's what we're after here. So to calculate the carrying value, well, five years have passed, so there are 30 coupon dates left. Our interest rate is 6% semi-annual pay divided by two, and we'll be using three per period, per semi-annual period. The payments, semi-annual, half the coupon rate, so 2.5% of face. The future value is 100% of face value at maturity, and then we can compute the present value. So all we've done is compute the present value at the same yield to maturity, but with n changed from 40 to 30. So our capital gain, our carrying value turns out to be 90.2% of face value. We sold it for 91.4. The difference, 1.2% of face value or $1.20 per $100 of face value. So that's how we calculate a capital gain or capital loss. I would think that's a very testable one, and you should be able to do that and ready to do that, and perhaps even eager to do that. So what are the effects of changing yield to maturity? Well, we're going to illustrate this with a couple of examples, and we're going to look at two extremes. So this is the first extreme. We buy a bond, and then the yield to maturity changes, but just prior to the first coupon date. Our coupon reinvestment rate, we're assuming to be the yield to maturity. So our rate of return, is our coupons that we get, plus our par value, plus our reinvestment income. And if we divide that by the purchase cost to the 1 over n, as we did in our earlier example, minus 1, that's our realized rate of return. Well, in this case, case 1, only reinvestment income is affected. So the yield to maturity goes up, the reinvestment rate goes up, the realized return. So if we hold this bond until maturity, the yield to maturity goes up or down right at the beginning. Well, we're going to hold it to maturity, so we've got no capital gain or loss. So the only thing that's changed is the earnings on our reinvested coupons. So if we're holding this bond to maturity, we don't really have any price risk. What we have is this reinvestment risk. So if it goes up and we hold it to maturity, we make more. If it goes down and we hold it to maturity, because our earnings on our reinvested coupons are lower, our realized returns are lower. So this is one extreme case, is that we hold it to maturity. In case two, instead of holding it to maturity, we're going to sell it. We're going to sell it right after we get the first coupon. So we're going to get the coupon, we're going to get the sale price, divide that by the purchase cost. It's for one period, so that minus one, that's our periodic rate of return anyway. If that first coupon is semi-annual, that's a semi-annual rate of return. In this case, only the sale price is affected. Why? Well, we're selling it right after we get that first coupon, so we're not reinvesting anything. But if the yield to maturity went up, sales price goes down, and if the yield of maturity goes down, that sales price goes up, and that's affecting our realized return. So I said these were extreme cases at each end, extreme assumptions. So this bond here has only the price risk, no reinvestment risk. If we held it to maturity, we said we've got no price risk. We're going to get the face value at maturity, the only risk we have is uncertainty about the reinvestment income we're going to earn over the life of the bond. So those are the two extremes. Somewhere in the middle, okay, we have both of those kind of offsetting each other, reinvestment risk and what I've called price risk here. Next, we want to talk about duration, and we'll start with Macaulay duration, the way the concept was first introduced. We will calculate Macaulay duration as the weighted average, where the weights are the 
percentage of the total present value of the bond in each of these components. And each of those payments there comes at a different point in time. So that's an annual pay bond. So we could say that that first 40 comes in one year, second one in two years, and that final payment in three years. So what we want is what percentage of the total bond value is in that third payment. This we're going to multiply by three. This percentage of the total value that's in that second coupon payment is here. We'll multiply that by two. So there's our weighted average of the times until the cash flows arrive. So this is what Macaulay did, and if we did it for this bond here, we get 2.8843. We're not going to use it as such. We're going to use a little more refined measure. But in general, Macaulay was trying to capture the sensitivity of a bond's price to changes in yield. As a rough approximation, we might say if yield to maturity changed by 1%, the value of the bond would change by 2.88% in the other direction. Well, we're not going to use Macaulay duration for this just because we have a more, more refined measures that are more accurate. Here's a calculation of Macaulay duration for a semi-annual pay, 4% bond, yield to maturity of 5%. So now, if period one is six months, period two is two six-month periods, three four, five, six, six months periods on our three-year semi-annual pay bond, when we do the weighted average of those numbers, one through six, we're really in semi-annual periods, so we need to divide that by two, and we get 2.8542 years. Now, was that higher or lower? Well, I guess I don't want to get into that. We'll highlight that difference and why it occurs in just a minute. So modified duration, that's one of our better measures. And what do we do? We take Macaulay duration and we divide it by 1 plus the yield to maturity. So we're adjusting Macaulay duration slightly and getting modified annual duration. And that's one of the measures we're going to interpret as the approximate percentage change in price for a 1% change in yield to maturity. So if we get a modified duration of 20, that means every time the yield of maturity changes by 1%, that bond value changes by 20%. We're going to use that as our measure of interest rate risk, or at least one type of interest rate risk. Now, we can calculate that. Um, for an option-free bond. We can just do that from the promised payments, right? The calculations we did for uh, Macaulay duration, our MAC dur here, all we need to know is the yield to maturity. We can turn that into modified duration. Now we've got this other measure, approximate modified duration. With that, we can use a price change from a pricing model. And so we're going to approximate it from using the actual price changes. Now, that, remember, because of convexity, the price increase when yield to maturity decreases is greater than the price decrease when yield to maturity um, increases. So we take the difference between those two, and we divide it by 2 times the initial price times the change in yield to maturity. And that change to yield to maturity is entered as a decimal. So let's consider a bond that's trading at a full price of 980. Remember, that's the full price. That's not the flat price. The yield to maturity increases a half a percent 
full price decreases to 960. The yield to maturity decreases by 0.5 percent, half a percent. The full price increases to 1,002. So now, if we go back, we've got the change in price. The price of the yield to maturity goes down, and the price of the yield to maturity goes up. We're tweaking the yield to maturity by the same amount in both cases. Here we used a half a percent. We could do it with a quarter percent. We could do it with a full percent. And where does that turn up? Well, when we put delta YTM here as a decimal, that's going to scale this to a 1% change so that we do get the approximate percentage change for a 1% change. So if it were a quarter, if, delta, if the change in yield we did up and down to get these prices was a quarter of a percent, that would be 0 0.0025. We would divide by that. If we did a half a percent change, we'd get a bigger difference up here, but we'd divide by 0 0.005, we'd divide by a little bigger number, so that's what I mean. That's acting as a scalar in this formula. So, shove them into the formula. Price of yield goes down, price of yield goes up, divided by 2, so we get the average of the difference there. We divide it by 980, that's the original price, that makes it a percentage change, and then we put in our half a percent as a decimal. This scales it, and we get an approximate modified duration of 4.9. And our interpretation is, for a 1% change in yield to maturity, we would expect about a 4.29% change in the bond value. Well, what if we have embedded options? If we have embedded options, we have to use effective duration, because we can't directly calculate the value of the bonds as yield changes. The cash flows with an, uh, an optionable bond, a bond with embedded options, are going to depend not only on the interest rate levels, but on the paths as to how they might get there. Now, effective duration is not necessarily better for small changes in yield. Modified duration, approximate modified duration, these are better measures for small changes in yield. We'll see why that is when we start looking at the uh, price yield curve here. But they're better for small changes. They get worse and worse the larger the change we try and use uh, the formula on. Or should I say, uh, the answer you get using approximate modified duration is further and further from the real price the larger the interest rate change that you put in to find the change in price. Okay. So we can either base this on a shift in the benchmark yield curve and, and then use a pricing model for bonds with options. Okay. So it's very similar to approximate modified duration, but now we're changing the benchmark yield curve, not just tweaking that summary measure of yield to maturity. So we have the price with the curve decreasing, price with the curve increasing, so very similar to the formula we just saw, and the denominator is the same, except now instead of the delta YTM, we've got the delta curve. We've got the change in the um, uh, benchmark yield curve that we've tweaked, rather than tweaking the yield to maturity. And so this, we're going to use a pricing model for bonds with options. We have to say, well, if interest rates do this, do this, do this, and then they're here, okay, the pricing model is designed to give us the price of this bond with an embedded call option or with an embedded put option. So with bonds with embedded options, we must use effective duration. If they don't have, if they're option-free bonds, Effective duration and approximate modified duration are basically the same, going to give you the same answer. Well, how about a new concept called key rate duration? Now, when we're talking about shifting the curve, we're talking about raising all those benchmark interest rates at the various maturities up a little bit or down a little bit in a parallel fashion. When we're tweaking the yield curve, 
we're also doing parallel shifts. Reason being, when we do yield to maturity, we're discounting every cash flow for that bond at the same rate. So when we tweak the yield to maturity, we're actually tweaking every one of those discount rates in our whole uh, calculation. So what we haven't really dealt with is a change in the shape of the yield curve. What if the long end is getting more expensive? Rates rising at the long end, tilting up of the yield curve, tilting down of the yield curve. Okay? How can we deal with that? Okay. So that's why we make this statement, Macaulay modified or effective duration measures price sensitivity for a parallel shift in the yield curve. But for changes in shape, we can use this key rate duration, sometimes called partial duration measures. Price sensitivity to a change in the benchmark yield for a specific maturity. So we may say, well, what happens to the price of this bond if uh, um, the rate at the five-year maturity goes up by a percent? Well, in practice, one of the ways you can do that is just take that up and then do lines, right, linear interpolation back to the others because we don't do every year with key rate duration. We may do the one year, three year, five year, uh, nine year, 13 year, whatever. Okay? So we tweak one of those rates and then we draw lines from that new rate to the other rates we're working with on either side of that, shorter maturity, longer maturity rates, and then we use those rates to price the bond. And that's how we're going to measure the sensitivity to a change in the five year rate sensitivity to a change in the seven-year rate or the nine-year rate, however it's structured. Okay? So these key rate durations may be used to estimate the effect on bond price of a steepening or a flattening of the yield curve. Okay, factors affecting duration. Now, we've introduced this a little bit. We'll get a little more formal with it here and reiterate it so it'll help you remember it and retain it. Longer the maturity, the higher the duration except for some deep discount bonds. Uh, we don't need, don't need to go any further than that, but just in general, we want to know longer maturity. Well, look, if you've got a two-year zero-coupon bond, say, it's Macaulay duration is two, and we're dividing that by one plus the yield to maturity squared. What if we had a 30-year zero-coupon bond? We divide it by one plus the yield to maturity to the 30th power. So which of those present values is going to change more when we tweak yield to maturity? Clearly that one where we've got yield, one plus yield to maturity to the 30th power uh, in the denominator. Okay. So longer maturity, higher price sensitivity to interest rate changes. The higher the coupon rate, the lower the duration. Well, when the coupon rate is higher, we've got some cash flows that come earlier. And those are less sensitive. The present value calculation for those is less sensitive than it is for payments further out. Another way to think of that is that the Macaulay duration is the weighted average of the times until the payments. Well, if we have a 30-year zero-coupon bond, the Macaulay duration is going to be 30. That's the only cash flow is at time 30. 100% of the value is on the cash flow at time 30. Now, what happens as we add some coupons? Well, as we have those coupons, now we've got the one, two, three, four, five, all those other time periods. And as we put at least some weight on those, the weighted average is going to be less than the 30. It has to be. Just another way to think about that, maybe remember it that way. And the higher the yield of maturity, the lower the duration. And we'll try and illustrate that for you. Now, this diagram, it's one I learned, uh, learned with when I studied for the CFA. It was from a book called Rates and Flows, Interest Rates and Flows by uh, Professor Van Horn from Stanford. I remembered it was a great book. I don't know why they gave it up, but I like this diagram. reason I like this diagram is it helps you remember these points. Imagine this level as being balanced on that point right there. And the weights there, those are the present values of all those payments. And so now we can say, well, what if we had less coupons? What if we had a zero coupon bond? Well, if we had a zero coupon bond, it would have to look something like that in order to balance if all those coupons were gone. 
Now, as soon as we start adding coupons, we've got to move this to the left. And that is this idea of the higher the coupon rate, the lower the duration, the more we're moving in this direction. Now, what happens if the uh, yield to maturity, if the discount rate goes up? Well, the discount rate is going to decrease these by more, by a greater amount than it's going to decrease these cash flows that come nearer in the future. And so that means when the yield to maturity goes up, the duration goes down. This gets, these get lighter out here, and these don't get light, don't lose their weight, their present value is rapidly, so that moves it like this. And lastly, pretty clearly, what if this were really time period 30 out here, and we just did kind of a break there and had them out to time 30. Well, clearly with longer maturity, we've got to move this way. And longer maturity increases the Macaulay duration and also increases our modified duration and approximate modified duration. So I hope that diagram helps you understand these a little better as well. Okay. So what about the duration of a portfolio? We've taken an individual security. We've estimated its duration and said, OK, now we have an idea of the interest rate risk. We have an idea of how the price is going to change when interest rates change. So it's price sensitivity to interest rate changes. And this is something we really care about with a bond portfolio, too. We're looking at risk here and managing risk. We want to know, well, how much interest rate risk do we have, or what I like to call price risk. Uh, because we're not really talking about reinvestment risk, we're talking strictly about price risk here in response to changes in interest rates. So there's two ways to do portfolio duration. One is theoretically correct, and the other was the one we're going to actually use in practice. So method one, the weighted average number of periods until portfolio cash flows are due to be received. So this is like Macaulay, but now we've taken all the bonds in the portfolio, instead of just those individual coupon payments and maturity value for a bond, we've plotted out every cash flow on every security in there. And so we're going to, this is a, a cash flow yield measure. Uh, it's an internal rate of return using the cash flows from all the bonds in the portfolio. So this is theoretically correct. It follows exactly what we did for an individual bond, and now we're doing it for a portfolio that has all sorts of different cash flows at different points in time. But it can't be used if bonds have embedded options. And so if we have a portfolio that's got some bonds with embedded options, along with option-free bonds and other types of bonds, we've got a variety in there, we can't use this measure. Now, a quick and clean way to calculate this, a quick and clean measure, is the weighted average of the bond's durations. So now we calculate the rates for all the bonds in the portfolio, and then we take a weighted average of those durations, right? What percentage of the portfolio value is in this bond with duration 7? Well, we multiply that weight. times 7. We do that times all the, for all the bonds in the portfolio. And if we have a bond that has an o embedded option, we can calculate the effective duration for that bond, and then just throw it in the mix here so we can keep those in there. The trouble is it's not theoretically so great because it assumes parallel shifts in the yield curve. That is, when I say, hey, the duration of my portfolio is 9. So the portfolio value is going to change 9% if yield to maturity changes by 1%. But when we say
changes by 1%, that's got to be every bond in the portfolio. Your short-term bonds change by 1%, your optionable bonds, bonds with embedded options change by 1%, your corporate bonds, your government bonds, your long-term bonds, your zero-coupon bonds, and that's really quite unrealistic, but you have a summary measure, you lose some information, you lose some detail, and sometimes a little bit of clarity, but that doesn't mean that it's not the best way to go because that cash flow yield is very difficult and then we have the problem of those bonds in there that have embedded options that we can't even include in our portfolio duration measure under method one. Okay, another term for you, money duration. We're just going to change this sensitivity into currency. Okay? We're going to take the modified annual duration and multiply it times the full price. So money duration per hundred of par value, which means we're pretty much in percent, take the modified duration, multiply it by the full price per hundred of par value, and this will provide an estimate of the change in the bond's full price per one percent change in yield to maturity. Okay. That hundred dollars of par value, we're just kind of adjusting for the fact that Although modified duration is telling us a percentage change for 1%, we've previously, when we divided by that decimal, we kind of scaled it up. So we get a modified duration of 5 instead of 5%. And so 5 per 100 of par value, that is 5%. So we've adjusted for that scalar is all. Price value of a basis point. Well, this is pretty straightforward. We're just going to say, what, what's the change in value? Per, remember, a basis point is one one hundredth of a percent. Uh, but it's just another measure of sensitivity of your portfolio to changes in yields, changes in uh, market interest rates. So if we have a 10-year 5% annual pay bond, it's at par, we've got a $100,000 bond. So the value at a yield to maturity of 499 is well, what it is, $100,077.25, the value at tweaking the yield up. So now that's our, that's our delta yield to maturity, right? We're just going, we're at five, so we're just going down one basis point and up one basis point, cranking out the prices. Now we've got the difference. Okay? We divide that by two to get the average, and we get price value of a basis point of $77.22. So if yield change by one basis point, that's the effect that we expect to see on the portfolio. Now, because these changes are so small, 0 0.01, we can often get away with just calculating one side or the other. But to be precise and theoretically correct, we want to use the average change. And remember, the increase when yields go down is more than the decrease when yields go up. Why is that? Convexity. Now, convexity doesn't have a, a terrific effect over small changes like one basis point, but it still has some effect. And now we'll look at that convexity adjustment and some of what I've said earlier that maybe didn't make that much sense at the time will start to make sense now. So here is our prices based, um, these are actuals. That's what I wanted to tell you. There's the actual curve. And when we use just duration, duration is like a slope. So the bonds trading here, we've actually done a linear estimate. We've estimated the, cur the slope of that curve at a point. It's not exactly duration. If this were on a logarithmic scale, then it would. We'd be kind of in percent land then, and we'd be OK. But you get the idea that down here, and this is another way to remember that at low yields, the sensitivity of a bond's price to changes in yields is more than at higher yields. Remember we said duration increased at lower yields and decreased at higher yields, other things equal. And so that changing slope along this price yield curve can help you remember that as well. So. These are prices based on duration, and you can see they're underestimates, right? Because we're going along this line, we're saying if yield goes from here to here, just using duration, we're saying the price goes to here, and it's an underestimate. But it's also an underestimate on this end. 
And so we need a convexity adjustment to give a, a more accurate estimate how the change is going to affect the bond's price. Approximate and effective convexity. Well, approximate convexity, convexity assumes the expected cash flows don't change. So that's our modified duration. That's the one we can crank out just from knowing the promised cash flows on the bond in the current yield to maturity. Effective convexity, just like effective duration, takes into account changes in cash flows due to the embedded options, right? Are they going to be called? I mean, we're saying, well, if interest rates do this and this and this and this and go down, they're going to call this, uh, this issue. And so that's what these models predict, and that's how we use them to price these bonds with embedded options. Okay. So while approximate convexity doesn't take these into account, effective convexity does. And one thing you should know is bondholders prefer more convexity to less other things equal. And remember, convexity says, well, when rates go down, it goes up by more than it goes down when rates go up. So given a level of interest rate volatility going forward, I'd much rather have more convexity than less. So here's our measures, approximate convexity. Just look at the terminology here. This is the value if rates go down, that's why we call it. So we're tweaking them down by change in yield to maturity. And this is the value if we tweak interest rates up. We're adding the two of them together and subtracting off two times the original value. We've got the original value down here, and the difference is instead of dividing by delta YTM, we're squaring that. Those of you that are mathematically inclined, well, this is a second term in a polynomial that is approximating the curve. We've added a second term. Guess what? We're going to get a better approximation of that curve, and we're going to get better estimates of what the price will be if the yield changes by a given amount. Approximate effective convexity, again, same difference we had for duration. When we talk about effective convexity, we're shifting the curve at each point by the same amount, it's a parallel shift in the curve, uh, and we're squaring this change as well. So this is our second order effect that we're going to use. Must use that when bonds have embedded options. Use this otherwise, and there's not that much difference. You don't have to worry about effective convexity uh, when there aren't embedded options. So what if we have an embedded option? What sort of changes do we see? Well, imagine a bond that's currently callable at this price right here. Well, if I own this bond and interest rates are falling, and normally that would mean the price is increasing up here, but why would I pay more than the call price if the next day or the next week they could call it for this price? I sure as heck don't want to pay this. So that's what's causing this uh, um, value to kind of roll over and reach a maximum. Okay, so two things to get from this. Here's the call option value the difference between the bond's price with an embedded call option and a straight bond, an option-free bond. So there's the call value right there. And remember, the callable bond is, value is less than the value of an otherwise identical straight bond. So that's what we're illustrating there. Another fairly interesting thing is that we could have an area of negative convexity there where it curls over like that. So if we see an example of negative convexity, I want you right away to think, gee, this may be a callable bond, maybe currently callable, but certainly callable in general bond to exhibit that negative convexity. What if it's a put? Well, if it's a put, that puts an effective floor on it. So as interest rates go up and bond values fall, Notice how it flattens out a little bit there and has a little less curvature out there. And so we look kind of at lower duration with a put feature, and we had lower even negative, um, um, with, well, we had negative convexity, but with a callable bond, because that price reached a maximum, it kind of rolled out flat too. So we'll certainly see lower duration, lower price sensitivity, 
as a puttable bond approaches its put price and as a callable bond approaches its call price. So how do we use duration and convexity? Well, let's put these two pieces together and convince ourselves that we have a better estimate of the bond's price change than we did with just duration. So this bond has a Macaulay duration of 7.5, approximate convexity of 130. So we know it's got positive convexity. These formulas work with negative convexity. If you're ever given a negative convexity number, just put it in and press forward. No difference in the calculation. So now our assumed change in yield to maturity is going to be a quarter of a percent, 25 basis points. So let's first look at the duration effect on the bond's value. We have a modified duration of 7.5, so a quarter of a percent change gives us a quarter of that, and that's 1.88, and that is 1.88 percent change. What about the convexity effect? Well, the convexity effect is always positive, at least when convexity is positive. When it's convex toward the origin, we have positive convexity, and that's because we're squaring the change in yield. So it doesn't matter whether it's an up move or a down move, we're going to square this 0 .0025, this change in yield we've put in as a decimal. And why? Well, remember from our diagram, Macaulay duration underestimated the value of the bond for both a yield decrease and a yield increase. So that's why with positive convexity, this second term is going to be an addition to the value. So that's what we get in that last line there for a 25 basis point decrease in yield to maturity. The price tends to go up by 1.88% because of its duration. And because of convexity, we're adding another four basis points to that. So we get 1.92% change. And that is closer to the real change because it's been improved by using both duration and convexity together to estimate the change in bond value in response to a change in yield to maturity. Now we've got a little out of left field one. What about the term structure of yield volatility? Well, there's one thing that we're supposed to get here, and that term structure means the yields are, can have different levels of volatility at different maturities. If short-term rates are driven by monetary policy and longer-term interest rates primarily driven by expected inflation and expected economic growth, then the short-term yield to maturity may be more volatile than long-term, right? So we've got more volatility in the short-term rates than in the long-term rates. And in that case, this term structure of yield volatility slopes downward, higher maturity, low volatility. So why do we even care about this? Well, we put that in red for you. The bond with a lower duration may have higher volatility to yield to maturity. So even though it has lower duration, the higher volatility for those short-term rates may mean that the price volatility of that bond, even though it has lower duration, in practice the price volatility is higher. And yield curve shifts are not necessarily parallel. Duration and the investment horizon. Well, I mentioned before we were going to use Macaulay duration for something really special. We went into that example and said, if you're going to sell that bond after one period, you've only got price risk. If you're going to hold it to maturity, then you've only got reinvestment risk. Those were our two extremes. And I said, well, at some point, they may tend to balance each other out between those two extremes. Well, that point is at the Macaulay duration. So Macaulay duration is the investment horizon at which price risk and reinvestment risk just offset each other. Okay? So if your investment horizon is 13.4 years and you buy a bond with Macaulay duration of 13.4 years, your reinvestment risk and price risk offset, right? Because if yield goes up, you get more reinvestment income, but your price goes down. We're selling before maturity, so we've got price risk. We're selling after we've con collected and reinvested some coupons, so we've got reinvestment risk.
that's the point at which they just offset. And so now when we're evaluating risk, if we know our investment horizon, which we should, we can look at the duration gap. Is the Macaulay duration different than the investment horizon? So if that duration gap is greater than zero, our Macaulay duration is greater than our investment horizon, and an increase in yield to, yield to maturity decreases returns. If the Macaulay duration minus the investment horizon is less than zero, meaning your investment horizon is longer than the Macaulay duration, then a decrease in yield to maturity decreases returns. Why? because you've got more reinvestment risk out there to the right, and you've got more price risk out there to the left. So out there to the left, where your investment horizon would be less than Macaulay duration, okay, you're down in the price risk part, so an increase in yield to maturity would decrease your returns. If your investment horizon is to the right of Macaulay duration, then you have primarily reinvestment risk, so a decrease in yield to maturity decreases your returns, or alternatively, an increase in yield to maturity would increase your returns when your investment horizon is longer than the Macaulay duration. Credit spreads and liquidity. This is some things that I think are not brand new to us. The benchmark yield is composed of the real risk-free rate and expected inflation. So that's the nominal risk-free rate is this benchmark, re benchmark yield. The spread to the benchmark includes premiums for credit risk primarily, but also a liquidity risk premium. So we can estimate the price effect of a change. in spread using duration and convexity. So this one's a no-brainer. We're just putting in, instead of the change in yield, we're assuming the Mark curve stays the same, and tweaking the spread, well, same thing as tweaking the yield. So, not surprisingly, our estimate is based on minus duration because yield up, price down, okay, times one half convexity times the change in spread squared. Now, we use that one half with convexity. Sometimes it used to be we did and we didn't, and in different readings it changed. And, and the reason that it's not set in stone is because it depends on how convexity 
is calculated. We calculated it without a 2. Remember with duration we had a 2 in the denominator. With the convexity we We did not. Had we added 2 in the denominator, we wouldn't need it to multiply it by 1 half now. But since we didn't, we will. So the pur purposes of the exam, and it is consistent, throughout the curriculum now when you apply convexity unless they tell you something different you should use one half that convexity in the right hand side of that equation well that about wraps it up for this point happy studying <laughs>